Now more than ever, it's time to come together. It's time to stand up and support each other so we can come out stronger on the other side. We are here for Canadians to make a difference when it counts. At KPMG in Canada, we're invested. I'm Marie Foley, a representative of the Board of Directors for the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. We are a proud sponsor of this event and delighted to be able to provide our technology platform for this virtual awards to take place. The Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships is a proud supporter of the Women's Infrastructure Network and more broadly of diversity and inclusion within the infrastructure community. Congratulations to all today's nominees. Welcome to the seventh annual Women's Infrastructure Network Awards. We have had seven incredible years celebrating the success and achievements of over 300 Canadian women nominated for the Win Awards. These women who represent all disciplines of infrastructure, who have played pivotal roles in the planning, development and operations of infrastructure projects in Canada. These women are an inspiration to all of us in the industry to reach new heights in our career and serve as a reminder of the importance to invest in the next generation. The Women's Infrastructure Network is very excited to be here with you today, once again, to commemorate the awards by recognizing the contributions to industry that women are making across the country. This year, we had an overwhelming response to our call for nominations with a record-setting 65 nominees from every corner of Canada and across all sectors, including public agencies, law firms, finance, design, engineering, and construction. Each nominee has demonstrated tremendous accomplishments in her career and is a trailblazer for those entering the industry. The incredible caliber of the nominees meant the nominations committee and judges had the extremely challenging role of selecting the shortlist and choosing the winners. With your commitment and the support from our industry sponsors, the WIN Awards program has been able to do more than acknowledge the achievements of women within infrastructure. The financial support combined with dedicated volunteers have allowed WIN to establish the WE WIN program a program that provides training, development, and mentorship of young women in infrastructure. We look forward to seeing these future leaders as WIN Awards recipients of tomorrow. The growth of WIN and the talent of nominees is a testament to the progress we are making towards achieving diversity in infrastructure. At WIN, we are committed to facilitating connections, exchanging ideas, and helping shape the infrastructure sector to reflect our values of equity, inclusion, and diversity. While we are honoring the winners today, the WIN Award celebrates each one of you who is working to make the infrastructure industry in Canada more inclusive for all. You are all winners. Congratulations to all of you. Hello everyone and welcome to the seventh annual WIN Awards program hosted by the Women's Infrastructure Network. As your MCs for the awards, I am Leslie Griffiths and this is Amy Kasnikis and we are co-chairs for the WIN Awards program. We want to start off by saying thank you to C2P3 for providing their Crowdcast platform to allow us to host our event virtually and safely from coast to coast. The awards allows us to recognize the strides being made to increase the representation of women within the infrastructure sector. All the women nominated this year are mentors, change makers, and pushing the status quo. They are helping pave the way for future leaders. We would like to take a few moments to acknowledge that this awards ceremony is being shown nationally on different traditional territories. 
Amy and I are joining you from Toronto, Ontario, on the traditional territory of the Wendat, Onishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. At WIN, diversity is at the core of our values, and we are committed to fostering a community that cultivates and celebrates diversity in all of our activities. It is a result of all of your support that the WIN Awards program is a success that it is today. Its success is also an indication of our growing influence in the infrastructure sector to help shape the agenda across the country. This year, in anticipation and celebration of the virtual WIN Awards program, we were able to hear from last year's winners through a fireside chat, uh, celebrate International Women's Day by networking across the country, and most recently celebrate the TSX market opening with this year's shortlisted nominees and TMX group, which we actually did this morning. Thank you to everyone that participated and made, helped make these events such a success. We're delighted to share with you the exciting program we have lined up for this afternoon. We're privileged to be hearing from one of Canada's honorable ministers, an esteemed officer of the Order of Canada, and of course, we'll get to hear who the winners are of the Emerging Leaders and Outstanding Leader Awards. Stay tuned as we have a packed agenda. Without further ado, we are excited to share with you a pre-recorded welcome remark from the Honorable Minister Monsef, Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Rural and Economic Development. Hello everyone, bonjour, Anin, salam alaikum. I wish I could be there with you. I wish we could meet in person, but I'm grateful to be able to join you from my basement in Peterborough, Ontario, on Michisagi and Anishinaabe territory. And I appreciate the opportunity to personally congratulate on behalf of the Prime Minister and the Government of Canada, the incredible nominees for this year's Women's Infrastructure Network Awards. I've been reading your bios, you are incredible women, you, uh, you are important role models for our sons and daughters and children watching, and you are building our communities up. We thank you. Our government got elected back in 2015 with a bold promise and a 12-year plan with $180 billion added to it to build up Canada with a historic infrastructure program. And more than ever, we need to continue to invest and support physical infrastructure, uh, whether the roads and bridges, water and wastewater facilities, housing. We need these physical infrastructure so, and the community spaces that bring us together, hopefully safely soon. We need also digital infrastructure. High-speed internet has become that much more important. It was already an essential service before COVID, but we've added urgency and historic investments through the Universal Broadband Fund are going to connect every single Canadian to high-speed internet and address the cell gaps that exist. And we're gonna be counting on you for that work. But there is also social infrastructure, childcare, for example, along with the care economy that are gonna help us get out of this she session. And I know that to the women, to the moms, to the caregivers who are also working and leading, that you've had a really tough time this past year. And you've heard Christia Freeland talk about universal early learning and child care and care workers, including those in our long-term care homes. So celebrate, keep up the great work, and remember, there's a budget being tabled in the House of Commons on April 19th. It'll be the first time that a woman tables a federal budget in Parliament. So tune in, and I do look forward to hearing how the celebrations go and the opportunity to connect with you again. Take good care, be well, don't forget to get your vaccines, and I look forward to our next connection. A big thank you to Minister Monsef for the warm message and welcome remarks. Next, we are pleased to be joined today by Margaret Catley Carlson, who will be providing our keynote address. Margaret is a Canadian civil servant whose distinguished career with the Canadian government and a multitude of global organizations like UNICEF, the United Nations, and the World Economic Forum has for more than five decades enhanced Canada's contribution to international development particularly as it relates to the protection and distribution of water supplies around the world. 
Margaret was made an officer of the Order of Canada in 2002 for her outstanding work in public service. She has received honorary degrees from 10 universities and was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012. Please help me in rec uh, welcoming Margaret. Margaret, over to you. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Merci m'avoir invité d'être avec vous, parmi vous cet après-midi. I'm delighted to be here. It's great fun to see the pictures of all the infrastructure work that's going on and that your members are associated with. And it's awe-inspiring to hear uh, the different fields that women are in now in infrastructure. Uh, you will probably have figured out very quickly uh, since in Leslie's kind in introduction, she certainly didn't mention a hydrologist, an agronomist, um, uh, an agriculturalist, uh, any of the ists that usually go into uh, water expertise and, and uh, people that become water experts. Uh, this is indeed true. Uh, my field has been as a public servant, as a diplomat, uh, both as Leslie said, in Canada and abroad. Uh, and my career in water started when three engineers uh, said they wanted to take me out for a free lunch. And I said, well, I know that you know that I know that you know that I know that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And they said, well, enjoy lunch and then we'll talk. So um, after lunch, they said, we want you to become the global chair of the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council. And I said, oh my goodness, that's a name that could only be conjured up by an engineer. Uh, it's not memorable, it's comprehensive. Uh, and it certainly wouldn't get anybody coming and knocking on your door and saying, I can't wait to find out what you do. And they said, yes, that's the problem. Uh, we're really good at the nuts and bolts and valves and things that you may not know anything about, but we're not good in policy and we're not good of the kind of policy that leads to better communication. And I said, well, yeah, I think I could probably try and do that. And then I'd get to learn at the same time what it is that you're doing uh, in the utilities. I didn't even know that that was where they all worked was utilities. Uh, it, but that was the beginning of something more than 25 years ago uh, that led to a very happy relationship between uh, my policy um, knowledge and the tremendous knowledge that uh, that the these experts had. Uh, the two of them worked quite well. Policy uh, was what I needed as a public servant to be able, and as a diplomat and as an international diplomat, to be able to say, well, why isn't this working? Why aren't people taking these good recommendations? Uh, what is the factor? Is it is it finance? Is it legal problems? Uh, what is it? Uh, because policy people, like like engineers, go at problems for, from a different angle of vision. So that was how I got into uh, being involved with uh, the with Davos, with uh, a number of uh, organizations which are listed in the CV. But mostly, they gave me the great pleasure of working with people who were right working in the water field. So uh, today, I thought that I would like to give you an idea of the picture of what's happening with global water. Uh, some of you may wish to extend your career into international field. I'd like you all to at least know a little bit about it. Uh, and uh, this may give you an idea of how your expertise would be very useful in solving some of the global problems in this area. So could I have the next slide, please? <coughs> I'm going to show you some pictures and what I'd like you to absorb is the picture, not the numbers. Uh, the picture basically says we're a watery planet, 97.5% of the planet is water, but then it shows you in the drop coming down from that, that only 2.5% of all that water is fresh water. And then if you go down to the next drop, it says, by the way, that fresh water is all encapsulated in glaciers, groundwater, ground and permafrost. And then it says under that, that the available fresh water, the kind we think of and the kind we work with in lakes and rivers uh, is really a very small percentage even of that percentage. So the first thing to start with, with when you look at water is, well, you know, don't we have an awful lot of water around the world? Well, the answer is yes, but also no, and you'll see why. 
move over to the other side of that uh, of that graph. And what that is showing you is that we, it's answering the question, what do we use this water for? And 70% of it is used for growing the food that we all eat. So we can't go around blaming other people. We all eat the food. We do, we have added an enormous number of people to the planet. And so therefore that, the, the demand there goes up and up and up. So that's basically just for you to remember. Uh, clearly we have a lot of water in the form of salt water, but that the desalination involved there takes energy and so far create, helps to, or at least adds to the uh, air pollution that causes our climate difficulties. Next slide. So here's another picture. And he, again, all I want you to do is remember the contrast between these two pictures, not what's written up there. Uh, this is a pictorial representation going from 1990 to probably about 2030. And it's the red, you can tell without knowing at all that the uncomfortable places to live are red and yellow and orange and the comfortable places up in the upper left hand corner are the blue places represented in blue. And these are the ones that in 1990 had relatively little or infrequent water stress. And you can see that a good part of the world was in that fortunate position. But there were definitely warning signs even at that time uh, in the Middle East and moving over to Asia. Now go down to the bottom, uh, the globe at the bottom down to the right, look at the difference. Uh, there's no more nice, dark blue, comfortable place. Every place in the world is having some instance of water stress, which means the unavailability of water at the time that people would like to be using it or for the purposes that it's been traditionally used. And not only that, that there's an awful lot of yellow in the globe, which says more than occasional water stress, and there's an awful lot of red, not just in Africa and Asia. Look over at, at uh, North America, and you'll see that that water stress extends, and not just in the United States, but also up into Canada. So the world has greatly changed in 30 years uh, and that stress factor, of course, makes huge demands for more infrastructure to help facilitate and the use of the water that we have. So those are the pictures I wanted you to remember, the great change. Um, why is that happening? Next slide. Basically, because we use more water than comes to us through the rain and through the melting of glaciers. Uh, again, you've got the green, but the red there simply says these are places that are overusing uh, the groundwater, the reserves of water they have. And look in North America there. Uh, there is a very real issue in our neighbors to the south, and that's recommend that covers a good part of the Ogallala Aquifer. And it also shows why there's difficulties in other parts of North America. And those will affect us. They will certainly uh, uh, call for more infrastructure. But they, more than that, around the world, they call, they have, it, it, they call for, they, they create huge problems. Next slide. What are these problems? Let's look at some of these. Uh, and I think that most of you, because you work in infrastructure, you'll know about the kind of issues that have arisen because of this. Um, first of all, 28%, uh, sorry, 2 billion people lack continuous daily access to safe, fresh water on an everyday basis. Uh, that means they don't have it all year. Uh, one in five children, therefore, is suffering from uh, the deaths attributable to one in five children have to do with uh, water that is not pure and is not clean. That still eclipses all of the other childhood diseases. 28% of freshwater fish are under uh, extinction warnings. The one that bothers me, I think, most is that important major rivers no longer get down to the ocean. What does that mean? It means that the Delta, which used to be there, both delivering water to the Deltaic uh, communities and also keeping salt water from climbing back up into the rivers, that stopped. When your 
delta is no longer a one-way stream of water coming downstream and in fact as allowing a lot of uh, salt water to go upstream you're changing irrevocably uh, some making some very important changes which affect agriculture which affect lifestyles and which sometimes empty out the delta entirely uh, groundwater levels are falling in the whole world you can tell that from the the, the overuse of water in a number of countries uh, and um, we, we have to cope with increasing variability with heat, drought, floods, etc., which all of you know who are involved in infrastructure that what you're designing now is not the same kind of thing you would have been designing 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, that's quantity issues, just a few of them. Quality issues are what make us sick. And these are not a mystery because in Asia, for example, about 80% of wastewater is not treated before it goes back into water. Uh, dilution is not a solution. Uh, and uh, therefore, without the infrastructure that can clean that, uh, th that, that wastewater, these people are in trouble. And 80% of that wastewater does not get cleaned. So we have illness and we have problems of uh, that nature. Canada, we've got climate variety as well. And we've also got real issues with remote communities, um, which are added to uh, by the, the changing amounts of water. Next slide, please. If you're wondering whether you're going to stay, keep on being employed in water infrastructure, uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. If you look at the last two bars in this slide over in the right-hand side, you will see that, the, uh, that the, the demand for water is going up and up and up. Uh, world water demand is going to grow by 55%. We don't have that much water, so that is going to mean more digging, more cleaning, uh, more desalination, all of those things simply to try and meet part of that demand. When I was just starting school, the global population was about 3 billion. It's now from 9 going to 10. So therefore, the food, remember, 70% is used for food. Just the food demands alone uh, are creating a huge demand for infrastructure and for getting the water to the food production and to all of the other uses for food, or sorry, for water. Next slide. Whose fault is this? Next slide. Well, <clears throat> it's tempting to blame the gentleman on the left, and he's definitely not helping. He's standing up to his ankles. Uh, in other words, he's overusing water in his crop, uh, and uh, that is a very real uh, issue area, certainly for India, with all the other issues that India has. But you look on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, we have had our own uh, sins and excesses. Pivot irrigation is those great big wheels that you have seen carrying water uh, to various parts of a field from a single source. And uh, when these were first brought out, a number of these pivot wheels used to throw water in the air at midday, thus causing uh, almost instant evaporation and wasting an awful lot of water. Pivots have changed. They're now in, among the leaders of doing things that have good ecological and good environmental purpose. But uh, we can't get over these problems and until we've got some, some solutions that work, including for the gentleman on the left-hand side. Next slide, please. So that is a capsule story of what the major global issues are for water management. It's a shortage of water. It's changing the character of the water that we have. And uh, coping with what is becoming a water shortage throughout the world because we're pulling the water out of the underground where uh, the, uh, the groundwater used to be our major source of, uh, of water. Uh, so, welcome to a world which needs you more and more. And I'm so glad to see the number of things that women are doing. When I first started traveling around the world with various water companies and organizations, I very rarely met women engineers, except in uh, the sanitation, in the uh, uh, sewage and sanitation field. 
uh, but hardly ever any in the uh, accountancy, the legal, uh, the uh, doing the important work of making sure that the uh, the upkeep and the maintenance was done. I hardly ever met uh, women uh, managers or women infrastructure experts in this area. And now this has changed completely. And you've got women construction bosses in water projects and all sorts of really encouraging things. Uh, we are going to have to make some changes in the way that we do things. Desalination will probably be used more and more. I hope that we not only reduce the amount of energy it takes to create desalinated water, but also the looking after the brine. At the moment, we're not doing that very well. We just put the brine back in the ocean. And so in an enclosed water space like the Red Sea, the, the salinity level just goes up and up and the coral and the fish and all the rest of it suffer the same. So therefore, we, we need real attention on desalination. We need new urban designs. Uh, that will allow us to use water in the urban area and then to take that water away and clean it for reuse. We already do that around the Great Lakes because we have to put 80% of the water back that we take out and it has to be cleaned when it goes back. So uh, this, this, none of this is, not all of this is new, but it's all getting more important and more urgent. Um, we need to build for water neutral buildings almost. Um, they're not perfect, but it's certainly better than uh, great, great wasteful buildings. Uh, we need bioengineering uh, for crops. That's a good one because it usually stops people dead and they say, do you mean uh, uh, bioengineered food? And I say, yes. In the last months, we have been so happy about the bioengineering that has gone into medicines uh, but we are still very leery about bioengineering associated with foods. Uh, maybe CRISPR will do something about that. But uh, the, if we're not going to use massive irrigation systems around the world, we've got to reduce the amount of water that's going to crops. And one of the ways of doing that is to reduce the demand of different crops for water. Wastewater reuse, one of my favorite topics. I think, I gather that in Canada, we're not doing much of that, although we're uh, in, I was pleased to learn that uh, on the North Shore that uh, we're gonna be producing biogas that will at least produce the energy to run the new plant when it is built. We're doing that across the country. I hope we move into real reuse of the nutrients that are in wastewater, not just for energy, but using the nutrients as nutrients. This is being done in not enough countries, but there's about 90 countries that are now reusing uh, wastewater after treatment. So that's definitely something that the world has to do. Canada with its water supplies is probably gonna be further down the line in actually doing this. And we need an irrigation revolution. But I'd like to say one more thing to you as women. We have learned so much. The 20th century was a wonderful century for learning, but we learned in silos and people became very expert in their own particular field. And academically, they were encouraged to write papers that only other people in the field uh, were writing about or were reading about. Uh, it's time to figure out how to get out of those silos because we can't just uh, be pursuing one or two goals. We have to be pursuing the social goals uh, and the goals that we need. And women are good at being aware of these and thinking about how these might be done. So I'm not one that has ever agreed that women and men have totally different skills. But in my watching, I think that women can understand when something is siloed and when it needs to start a conversation with another silo very related to the issue. So please go out and knock down a few silos. Thank you for inviting me and good luck and congratulations to the winners today, but congratulations to all the nominees. Uh, clearly you're an amazing group and I'm glad to be talking to an amazing group. Thank you very much. Thank you. for sharing your experiences from your impressive career and also sharing your perspectives around the importance of water infrastructure within Canada and globally. You're truly a role model and have definitely helped pave the way for women in the sector and it was so great to hear from you today. 
So uh, we've now reached the part of the event we've all been waiting for, where we get to celebrate the contributions of the women in our industry. Today, we formally get to celebrate the women that have been nominated and shortlisted, but I think it's important to note that each and every one of you are making significant and meaningful contributions to our industry day in and day out. I now want to turn it over to Gordana Tukalis, Senior Vice President of Human Resources from ACON, our gold sponsor, to present the Emerging Leader Award. Over to you, Gordana. Thank you. The Emerging Leader Award recognizes an exceptional woman who has distinguished herself early in her career in the infrastructure sector and has showcased herself to be an emerging leader of the infrastructure industry of tomorrow. This year, the Emerging Leader category received 39 nominations, representing women from across Canada. It is incredible to see the representation across all sectors and geographies. To evaluate the nominees, the nominations committee and judging panel considered their early demonstration of leadership within their profession, high potential and dedication to the advancement of women in the sector. Now let's hear a bit about each individual shortlisted. The Emerging Leader Award celebrates an exceptional woman who has distinguished herself early in her career and has demonstrated a pattern of early leadership, achievement, and mentorship, making a significant contribution to the infrastructure sector. We want to thank each of the nominees for the incredible contributions they have made to the infrastructure sector. And now, let's meet our five shortlisted 2021 Emerging Leader nominees. Chloe Ho has worked with industry leaders as an auditor and advisor on public energy companies with a more than $10 billion market cap and has worked across three different continents. Jillian Beaton was at the helm of the City of Calgary's cost-benefit analysis of its 2026 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games bid and advised EY's advisory team on a $1.7 billion light rail transit project. Marie-Eve Belzil has worked with clients across Canada and is committed to mentoring other young women in infrastructure. Through teaching and volunteering, she gives back as a mentor to her community. Tiffany Wong currently leads multiple teams working on large-scale construction projects across the 400-kilometer stretch of the Trent Severn Waterway and Rideau Canal systems and is an ambassador for women in STEM across multiple schools. Valerie Blinch has worked on projects in Canada and the US and was one of the founding executive committee members of the Young Leaders in Infrastructure, expanding the organization into Vancouver, Montreal, and Ottawa. The Women's Infrastructure Network is thrilled to be honoring such accomplished young leaders. To think that there are people who hold me in the same steed as some of the previous female winners, um, I'm incredibly honored and excited. I'm just so proud to be sort of in the same company as everyone that's that's been shortlisted here, particularly given the large number of nominees this year. Equity and diversity is important to every profession, but especially in traditionally male-dominated fields like engineering. So I think it's good that uh, we get that visibility from the WIN network uh, to to share that with the community. When you realize that you're not alone, um, you become more more confident in in um, your thoughts and 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 hopefully become more vocal. One of my mentors told me like, "Hey, the number one thing you need to learn is to speak up more often because your ideas are valuable." And hearing that from him was very important to me. And what really gave me that boost of confidence that I needed to either get through and, and finish a project or look at something in a, in, a, in a different way is really having my supervisors back um, and them expressing their confidence in me and letting me know that I have what it takes. By empowering women to be more involved, we can build better teams. I think the best I can do is really be myself and um, make sure that people see this as, hey, I can be a woman and I can do this as, as well. 
You know, I think I'm really passionate about driving change just because of, you know, obstacles and challenges that I've faced uh, throughout my career. And I feel that this nomination will help reinforce and support me into becoming um, and growing uh, and continue to be the leader that I aspire to be. We need to connect, we need to collaborate, and we need to vouch for each other across disciplines. These inspiring women have shown excellence and continue to contribute to progress in infrastructure every single day. To get this far is an achievement in itself, and we're proud to be honoring such an accomplished group of young leaders. Congratulations to our shortlist for the 2021 Emerging Leader Award. What an extremely talented group of women. Thank you for sharing your stories and congratulations to all of you. Now let's see who the winner is. The winner of the seventh annual Women's Infrastructure Network Emerging Leader Award is Marie-Eve Belzil. Congratulations, Marie-Eve. This is a fantastic achievement and demonstrates how impactful your career has been as an engineer and how important your support has been as a mentor and a leader. We invite you on to say a few short words. Hello, am I on screen? Yes, you are. Oh, hi. Wow, I'm so, <laughs> I'm just too excited. Uh, I guess that's the time I say thank you. Um, first of all, I can't believe it uh, among all the other uh, nominees. Um, during the week, we had the chance to meet all of us all together and uh, what an amazing group of women. Uh, the first person I wanna thank is uh, Sharmila, who uh, nominated, nominated me, so thank you so much. Um, and also uh, the committee, I just want to say that they're doing an excellent job um, making uh, us feel really uh, empowered by this. And this is a great honor for me to uh, get this uh, this year. Uh, thank you so much. Um, of course, I want to thank uh, the people I've worked with throughout the years um, at SNC Lavalin, but also with different companies that we've worked together uh, through our different joint venture project or consultants or even um, at Algonquin College, where I've been teaching for four years. Uh, of course, my family and friends have supported me through all this. Uh, so I'm just really excited. And uh, also, I just wanted to, to tell people, um, for people who actually want to get there uh, to be recognized as a leader, just be bold, be yourself, and seek feedback. And uh, you can do it. We can all do it. So thank you very much for, for this. Thank you. Congratulations, Maria. You've really shown what it is um, to be an emerging leader winner. So you were really an inspiration to all of us. So thanks for sharing those kind words. I now want to turn it over to Christine Remedios, Global Head of Inclusion and Diversity at KPMG, our platinum sponsor, to present the Outstanding Leader Award. Looks like you're on, Christine. Oh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear you. Thank you, Leslie. I'm delighted to be here today uh, to present this award. Um, the Outstanding Leader Award recognizes a woman who has distinguished herself in her profession, has shaped the world we live in, and has demonstrated a unique ability to guide and inspire others within the infrastructure sector. This year, the Outstanding Leader category received 26 nominations representing women from across Canada within a multitude of sectors. 
to evaluate the nominees, the nominations committee and judging panel considered their demonstration of breaking new ground and paving the way for women in the sector while excelling in their field and serving as a role model. Now let's hear from each shortlisted nominee. The Outstanding Leader Award is presented to a woman who has distinguished herself in her profession and within the infrastructure sector. She has shown a unique ability to guide and inspire others. We want to thank each of the nominees for the incredible contributions they have made to the infrastructure sector. And now, let's meet our six shortlisted 2021 Outstanding Leader nominees. Cheryl Nelms oversees a portfolio worth more than $6 billion, showing leadership in collaborating with industry, academia, and government in executing complex agreements. Godine Sibe is a trusted legal and strategic advisor to the infrastructure community and was named one of Canada's most powerful women by the Women's Executive Network. Jody Becker sees infrastructure through a legal lens she is committed to transforming Ellis Dawn into the most technologically advanced and sustainable construction company in the world. Johanna Navis has led some of BC's largest infrastructure projects and has participated in some of the most transformative builds in Canada, like the Potulo Bridge and Broadway Subway Skytrain extension. Karen Mill specializes in providing legal support at the project procurement stage and has worked with Capital Division, BC Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of Employment and Investment. Kara Maras was the first female manager in Winnipeg and is committed to mentoring young women in infrastructure. 83% of the engineers she oversees are women. All these women have impacted their environments in an exceptional way, and we are delighted to be celebrating them. To be on the shortlist with so many other incredibly talented women is it, quite a thrill. To be nominated in it amongst itself is just a huge honor. I'm looking at that list of nominees, and they are all incredible leaders in their own right. They have done incredible work for the country. They have built people, places, and communities. And I am so honored to be among their number. There are lots of times in this business where you want to just throw your, throw your towel in. Um, so I think I'm most proud of the fact that even in the really toughest moments that I've kind of kept going through that. Being proud of being a woman, being proud of being an immigrant, being proud of having an accent, Again, it's taking me a long time, but uh, I, you know, I am now I look back and I think like just I accomplish a lot and I, I, I bring my whole self to my profession. When I started my career, there weren't a lot of women in engineering. And so I now manage a team with numerous women. I work with women every day. And so um, trying to just support them and, and really encourage that. I think that's been a great thing to see over the course of my career and if I've, if I've encouraged anyone or helped anyone along the way, I think that's probably probably the biggest thing for me. You know, what, what I'm super proud when I, when I see a team that's put together uh, where it's, it's truly diverse, like uh, culturally, um, gender, gender spectrum, all aspects. One of the challenges that I think we continue to face is are the assumptions that people make about what it takes to be successful in the infrastructure sector. My mission, my, my, what I've been always trying to do all my life has been to continue to broaden people's understanding of what a leader looks like and championing people who are not the stereotypical leader. Because I think that individuals should be judged on their skills, capacities and abilities. And if we don't do so, then our industry, ourselves, our society are hurt because we lose out on those voices and those viewpoints and those talents. Organizations like WIN play an absolutely critical role in closing this gender gap. You know, sometimes we can feel like there's not very many of us out there and it can be a little isolating. The network that is created by WIN is really a ready-made um, 
group of mentors for everyone in the industry. You know, if it wasn't for Wynn, I wouldn't know about the amazing careers and the amazing challenges and, and accomplishments all these nominees have uh, achieved in their lives. These inspiring women have had truly exceptional careers and continue to contribute to progress in infrastructure every single day. To get this far is an achievement in itself, and we are proud to be honoring such an accomplished group of trailblazers. Congratulations to our shortlist for the 2021 Outstanding Leader Award. Wow, congratulations. This is an exceptional group of shortlisted outstanding leader nominees. You are truly making a difference to shrink the gender gap. And with that, I am honored to announce the winner of the 2021 Women's Infrastructure Network Outstanding Leader Award is Godine Sabe. Congratulations, Godine. You have demonstrated what it means to be an outstanding leader. We invite you on to say a few short words. Wow, thank you so much for this amazing recognition. Merci beaucoup. Okay, I want to say a few words, so please bear with me. It's going to be a little bit, uh, because well, I have to say why this recognition is so very special to me. And my apologies if I read them, I'm quite overcome with emotion at this moment. The start of Women's Infrastructure Network, WIN in Toronto, was such a humble one. In 2008, after attending a few industry conferences, Lynn Graydon and I wondered, why were there so few women in the infrastructure sectors? And we floated the idea of WIN at some informal social events we organized. Excitement grew and people noticed. And in 2009, with the addition of the amazing and incomparable Jennifer Quinn and Dana Donald, WIN was formed. The small but mighty steering committee in Toronto grew to include Divya Shaw, Lindsay Carpets, Julie Parla, and Yegina Pachtaman. And there have been so many great WIN leaders since. Thank you all. And WIN chapters formed across Canada in Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Ottawa, Montreal, and Saskatchewan. And it's part of a global network operating in the US, Australia, and the United Kingdom. But why did WIN resonate? We saw that women in the public and infrastructure sectors needed an inclusive means to network, to exchange ideas, to build their profiles, to gain experience and to help lift each other up in a sector that had very few women leaders and champions and role models. And even more importantly, to shape the infrastructure agenda in Canada. I also felt strongly that it was very important to shine a light on the amazing women in our sector. And these awards today were focused on recognizing those amazing work being done by our peers each and every day. And so having seen up close the caliber of women being nominated and recognized over the years, I am truly humbled to have been given a place among them. The women this nominated this year, they're all truly exceptional. Please take the time to read their bios, and I want to congratulate each of them. Thank you to this WIN Awards Committee. You have been amazing, and special thanks to Margaret Catley Carlson for her call to action to continue to break down sectors in the, to continue to break down silos in the infrastructure sector. And I also wanna say special thanks to Jennifer Quinn and Dana Donald for nominating me and for Tony Rossi and Aaron Corey for providing wonderful letters of support. As you all know, infrastructure in particular, it takes enormous teams, it takes dreams, and it brings dreams and vision to life. So I want to acknowledge each of my colleagues at McCarthy Tatro for being by my side and for all we have accomplished in my years at the firm and for all the partners, clients and colleagues who I've had the great privilege to work with. Thank you. And I also want to do a very special shout out to my four wonderful sons. Who have stood by me and been my greatest champions throughout my career. Thank you. And there are so many others. Thank you. I am thinking of you too. 
With organizations such as WIN, it can be hard to see the progress in the moment. But when I look at infrastructure today, and I see women in elected positions in infrastructure, federally, provincially, including in Ontario, BC and New Brunswick, and as board chairs of important institutions, such as the Canada Infrastructure Bank, as well as over 1,000 WIN members across Canada, I see the tremendous impact over the last 12 years of the important advocacy work of WIN and its members. This inspires, this matters. This is the Women's Infrastructure Network. Thank you, MSC Boku. Thank you, Gideen, for your thoughtful and inspiring remarks. And congratulations again on this great achievement. We're so excited for you. This event has showcased all the incredible things that are happening across our industry to champion women. And we're so grateful for your continued support of the Win Awards. Despite the challenges of networking over the past year, it's so encouraging to see that this community rallied together and put forward the largest group of nominees to date. We look forward to your continued support and nominations of women across our industry from all diverse backgrounds, as it is so important to consider the intersectionality of all aspects of equity, inclusion, and diversity. We would like to once again congratulate all the nominees across both categories, including our winners, Marie Eve and Gadine. Both of you will be entitled to direct a financial contribution to an institution or not-for-profit entity to assist women looking to embark on a career in an infrastructure-related field. Past winners have directed scholarships to organizations ranging from post-secondary institutions to science camps right across the country. We also want to take the time to thank our sponsors and volunteers, without whom this event would not be possible. Their generosity helps make programs like the WIN Awards and the WeWin program possible. The WeWin program is designed to support and enhance the skill sets of women in the infrastructure field, and a new round of WeWin mentorship applications are now open. There is a strong need for mentors, so please consider applying, as I have heard firsthand from mentors that it is a mutually rewarding experience. And with that, we want to invite you to watch one final video to close off the WIN Awards. We look forward to seeing everyone again next year. The Win Awards program is a celebration of all nominees. You are all inspiring women whose commitment, hard work, and leadership moves our industry closer to equality. From the Women's Infrastructure Network, we thank you for being our role models and for the contributions you have made to the infrastructure sector. We would once again like to thank all of our members and all the remarkable people at the Women's Infrastructure Network. Thank you to the volunteers who work tirelessly behind the scenes to make the WIN Awards possible. Thank you to our judges who had the difficult job of selecting our shortlist and winners from an incredibly talented group. And of course, thank you to our mentors, mentees, steering committees, and supporters. And a special thank you to the generous sponsors. None of this is possible without you. Congratulations again to our emerging leader winner, marie Eve Belzil, and our outstanding leader winner, Godin Sebe. To be selected from groups of nominees containing such stellar candidates from across the country is a remarkable achievement, and we congratulate both of you. The Women's Infrastructure Network has come a long way with all of your support. At WIN, we are committed to growing our influence through networking, training, advocacy, mentoring, and community involvement. We look forward to seeing all of you at future WIN Awards events and local WIN events. And once again, congratulations to all.